Hello, welcome. Please press like and subscribe. I am really delighted to be joined by Zach Plansky, who is the deputy leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. Uh, I've been meaning to speak to the Green kind of Green Party crew, I suppose, for a while. Lots of people have been nagging me to do so. And I think there's lots of very, very big reasons, both in terms of our politics here in Britain, but also what's happening to the planet, which is obviously a big part of what the Green Party uh, exists to talk about and to fight for. Uh, so yeah, Zach, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. First off, just own your general pricey, Britain, 2023, Rishi Sunak's Britain, fourth prime minister, um, or third prime minister, sorry, for, since 2016, we are on about 30% of all our post-war prime ministers. Um, David Cameron, Theresa May, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, Liz Truss, Rishi Sunak. I mean, it's been quite a roller coaster. I just want to sum up. Where do you see the state of Britain from the Green? What were the Green Party's kind of analysis of this is Britain now? I mean, it's beyond dire. We have a xenophobic government that are determined to push working class people and the poorest people into even more poverty whilst allowing the super rich to get even richer and richer. I've been deputy leader a year, a year this week. So actually, it's really nice to be on your show. And thanks for having me. Um, it was the same week Liz Truss was elected as prime minister. Now, I don't think Liz Truss should ever be seen as an outlier. She is actually the natural extension of Tory ideology. If you go down the free market that much, Liz Truss is what you end up with. And Rishi Sunak, I guess, would argue he's wheeling back from that, but it's still absolutely insipid in everything he does, is this idea of destroying public services. But then we've got a complete lack of the opposition. You know, Keir Starmer could not be more vapid. It's like this middle manager who just does not have a vision, who seems to be pulled all over the place, seems to be U-turning at every moment. But some of these U-turns are deadly serious. Things like allowing child poverty to get even worse by not even committing to removing the child benefit cap, uh, not standing with refugees and actually talking about refugees in a way, uh, criticising the Tory policy, not because it's inhumane, but because it's too inefficient for Keir Starmer. And then we also know the new Labour's position on striking workers, just absolutely no solidarity whatsoever. So to sum up your answer, I think there's this big space where there is a complete lack of hope and complete lack of vision from our two main parties. I see the Green Party as that hope and that vision. We often say there's no environmental justice without racial, social and economic justice too. So this is recognising that all of these things are interconnected. And ultimately, you need to make sure that workers' rights, that fair pay for people, that we're taxing wealth, a redistribution of income, all of those things are there. And we badly need more Green MPs. So, I mean, on that, if I was going to, you know, with the Green Party, sum up kind of where you're at now, I'd say, if not now, when? I mean, the, the planet is on fire. I think the climate emergency is more real in people's heads than it's than it's ever been. But if we're talking about British politics, not only do we have a catastrophe, a social catastrophe under the Conservatives, I think the most ruinous post-war government in, uh, in British democratic history, um, but a Labour Party which has abandoned a load of key transformative promises that Keir Starmer made in the leadership election, public ownership, workers' rights, tuition fees, I mean, a whole range of, you know, I mean, taxing the rich. Um but what I don't get is if I were the Green Party now, I would be throwing hell for leather at disillusioned Labour voters. I'd be saying your party has abandoned you. It doesn't stand for you anymore. It doesn't stand for things like public ownership, taxing the rich, investing in our public services. Your new home is the Green Party. I don't see that. And I guess I'm confused. What's going on? Why isn't the Green Party throwing everything it's got at potentially millions of disillusioned Labour voters? Yeah, so I think the big argument is we are, but actually a lot of the time we're not getting the media time. So that's why I really appreciate interviews like this and, and other similar interviews I've done, because it gives us a platform to then be able to speak. And actually, there's a genuine correlation between whenever I do an interview like this and our join numbers, we see more and more members coming. Now, do I know if those are disaffected Labour voters? No, I don't. It would be a lie to say I do. But I think there's clearly a strong correlation there. I think also in my role in City Hall, for instance, I challenged London Mayor Sadiq Khan recently. I've been asking him about private jets. Um, I asked him if he'd consider banning private jets in London. I think this is a signal of excess wealth and just a very obvious thing that any kind of progressive person should do. Not only could I not get him to ban private jets, he refused to even condemn them. And so what I said to him at the time on, on public record is you're literally defending the 1%. You're a Labour mayor who is standing with the super rich rather than doing something that is totally quite easy to do and say people should stop using private jets in a climate emergency. Now, I'm not looking to pick on Sadiq Khan there. I think he's better than some of the others. But I think that is like a tangible example 
of where the Labour Party are at this point, which is terrified to stand on this platform. And I think the Green Party do have a really, really strong platform. And when I think about places like Brighton, where Sean Berry is standing uh, to take over from, from Caroline Lucas and looking for the voters of Brighton to continue with a green seat there. And in Bristol Central, I think there's an obvious example there where, so take Bristol, for example, uh, there's 14 councillor seats, 12 of them are already green. Now, it's true that people do vote differently nationally to locally, but you can also do the maths that if everyone voted green nationally as they did locally, Carla Daniel will be the next MP for Bristol Central. And I think there's these obvious examples where you've got I think it's fairly accepted that we are looking at a Labour government. I don't think it's going to have as strong a majority as Keir Starmer would like, because I think he's going to mess it up at every opportunity. But I think the Tories are so done at this point that it does look like it's going to be a Labour government. Every vote for a Green MP is making sure there are people in there who will be holding a Keir Starmer government to account. And ultimately, if you look at someone like Fangham Debonair, that is just another MP working for Keir Starmer, whereas Carla Denyer will work for the people of Bristol and the people of Britain to tackle the climate emergency and stand up for social justice too. At 2010, David Cameron becomes Prime Minister. And what you see there is the growth of UKIP. And what UKIP did, I would say very successfully, is frighten the Conservatives so much that they dragged the Conservatives, I would say not just onto their political terrain, they basically took over the Conservative Party in some basic political ways. And I just wonder if you see that with the Green Party, that Labour comes to power, and um, it's not 1997 when you had economic growth and rising living standards because of an unsustainable bubble, which went pretty spectacularly. But nonetheless, that was the context at the time, benign. Um, this time they're offering less, less investment and so on. They don't have a big shiny policy like the minimum wage. Um, but at the same time, the country's in a far graver mess. Couldn't that be the Green Party could end up being the UKIP of the left, that you could end up with disillusionment with a Starman government kicking in? Lots of people go, hold on, we got rid of the Tories, but my life's not getting better. You could then use that to do what UKIP did and change British politics. Is that something you're talking about? I think there's a lot of truth to that. But I think the thing I would resist in that analogy is UKIP were always kind of that protest movement that have essentially now hijacked the Conservative Party. And we have these far right fools uh, running our government. I think the Green Party, we are much more serious about a long term sustainable platform. So I take half the analogy in terms of, yes, absolutely, I'd like to see more Green MPs and look at a Green government like we have in Scotland, where we're in coalition there, in Germany, where we're in government again. But I think this has to be about a longer term than just kind of a short hit. Ultimately, we need to look at transforming our society. And I don't think that has to be a bad thing. You know, when people say, oh, you know, this this net zero agenda, well, we're talking about cleaner air, greener jobs, unionized jobs. We're talking about more cohesive communities. We're talking about tackling the gender pay gap, the disability pay gap, the ethnicity pay gap. All of those things are things worth doing in and of themselves. Of course, they will tackle the climate emergency and I'll advocate for them because they're green issues. But actually, even just as fundamental, they're the shift that we need for our society. And I think we've seen a Labour Party that are never going to do those things. And the thing I would add to that as well is we saw for a brief moment under Jeremy Corbyn, that arguably the party was moving in that direction or certainly a similar direction. But Keir Starmer has now removed even the mechanisation to allow another Jeremy Corbyn or another left wing or another socialist, whatever, how, whatever label you want to use, to ever leave the Labour Party again. So I think in terms of theory of change, people really need to be looking at the Green Party, where we're a grassroots democratic party, we're one member, one vote, we go to conference and we legitimately vote on things and those become policy. I would argue that other parties sometimes imitate that. They have these kind of conference set pieces. But as we've seen for proportional representation, for instance, Labour now back proportional representation, but Keir Starmer simply said no. The trade unions backed proportional representation, but Keir Starmer said no. That is not a democracy, and that's not how you can ever get anything changed. In the Green Party, we genuinely have a grassroots democracy. Now, you could criticise that, and I think there's legitimate criticism. That slows things down sometimes. Sometimes we don't move as fast as I would like us to move. But I think that's got to be the right balance between a party that is legitimately democratic, where every member has an equal say, and being able to respond to the kind of fast, accelerated uh, media kind of time that we need to. And I think we're getting that balance just right. Just, just in terms of how you're kind of pitching yourself, I suppose, is part of the issue that, I mean, if you look at the recent local elections, the Greens did very well indeed. And I'm sure you, you were delighted with the performance of the Green Party in the local elections and exceeded, I think, the expectations that, for example, the polling might suggest is. But a lot of that success was in conservative areas amongst voters who may not be naturally that well disposed to trade unions or 
being on the left. And isn't the issue that that kind of stops the Green Party becoming a out-and-out left-wing political force because you've got to pitch yourself to urban left-wing disillusioned Labour voters, but you're also pitching yourself to voters who've never voted for the Conservatives, who are probably more Lib Demi or even old-style one ne- one wet Conservatives, maybe. Yeah, I think that's a really legitimate question. And, and on those election results, I was on Politics Live that day with Joe Coburn, who I'm sure you'll know well. Labour had gone up 10% in relative gains. Uh, the Green Party went up 46% in relative gains. It was literally a seismic shock of, of an, a local election result. And it wasn't a one-off either. That's happened at every single local election for the past three or four years. And Joe Coburn said, I was remarkably chipper, as if I was kind of overplaying how, how well we'd done. But to come back to your question directly, so I think there's a few things here. One, I think a Conservative voter and a Conservative MP are very different things. So while I'll absolutely slate a Conservative MP anytime, I think a Conservative voter can genuinely care about clean air, they can genuinely care about green spaces, and they're not necessarily xenophobic, transphobic, homophobic, or, or racist. Now, of course, we will never appeal to that kind of segment of society, and I'll absolutely stand with that. But that doesn't mean that you can't appeal to people who are out of your natural base. Now, that gets complicated because there are conservative voters we will never appeal to. And I think that's where you uh, stand strong with your values, as we absolutely do. And and just be really clear what you stand for. In terms of those local election results, I think there was a few things. So number one, the amount, the geography of where local elections were this year tended to be in rural Tory facing areas. So I think that was partly just a question of mathematics. And if we were going to do well, we were always going to do well in those Tory areas. But I would note the places like South Tyneside, Burnley, where we absolutely smashed it. And you can't get much more Labour heartland than than South Tyneside or Burnley. And, you know, when I went to those places and door knocked time and time again, I know politicians always say when I was door knocking, but I genuinely do ridiculous amount of hours of door knocking because I enjoy it. And you just hear those conversations from people who very quickly say, you know, I've voted Labour all my life. I'm thinking about voting the Green Party, but I'm worried that you're really good on the environment, but you're not good on those social justice issues. So it's no coincidence when I started this interview with you, the first things I talk about, you know, I want to talk about things like renting, how to protect our NHS, uh, supporting striking workers, how we stop kind of warmongering around the world. These issues are really important to the Green Movement as well. I think we've often just been painted as the Environment Party. Of course, the environment is front and centre of everything we do, but as I said, it's all interlinked. And then there's a third thing, which I, I think it's about um, where we stand, uh, turnout tends to go up. And when turnout goes up, that means you're not necessarily getting just disaffected Tory voters. A lot of the people who are voting Green are people who are voting for the very first time. They've looked at the Labour and Tories and they've gone, actually, there's nothing there for me with either of these parties. They don't believe in Rishi Sunak and they don't believe in Keir Starmer. So when you have that kind of local energised campaign where people are knocking regularly and saying, we will genuinely listen to you, you will genuinely get a community representative, then that can shift people's opinions. And I think a lot of that is why we're winning in very local areas Mm -hmm. that surprised the national media but did not surprise us in those local areas because those representatives were working really hard and have continued to work really hard as local representatives. I do want to talk to you about those, just, you know, those policy areas. One thing I do want to talk about is a controversy, which I know has erupted partly on your Twitter feed. And um, this reg- is regarding Joe Bird, who used to be a member of the Labour Party. She's a Jewish. She was a Jewish member of the Labour Party, which is quite important to describe, I think, as a context. But she was um, a Corbyn supporter um, and she was kicked out of the Labour Party um, for retrospectively speaking at a banned groups meeting. Um, she's now the Birkenhead candidate for the Green Party. Um, the Jewish Labour movement, amongst others, has condemned Joe Bird's inclusion in the Green Party, um, accusing her of being allied to those, basically, who they've accused of anti-Semitism. I think that's the gist of what they're saying. Um, now, you tweeted, there's been five Jewish people in leadership positions in British political history. I'm really proud to be one of them, and I'm proud of the role the Jewish Greens play more widely in the Green Party. A Labour councillor tweeted, the entire party is a joke. Look forward to eradicating the Greens from Parliament at the next election. That was quote tweeting what you said. I'm just interested in kind of what you'd say, what you'd say in terms of what's been levelled against Joe Bird. But also, yeah, that particular controversy. Yeah, so I'm going to be fairer to that Labour councillor than I think Labour are ever to the Greens. And I found out that councillor is actually Jewish. So I'm not even going to claim anti-Semitism, you know, in my direction. But what I will say this is, you know, the Jewish Labour movement have done various tweets and letters demanding that the Green Party take certain action. And 
I'm looking for the words and, and I can't find a better word than that is absurd. Like we have an internal democratic process. We have a very clear code of conduct, particularly around anti-Semitism and all forms of racism. The idea, you know, the analogy would be it's like the Jewish Greens writing to Keir Starmer because they're unhappy about a decision they've made in the Labour Party. That is not how democracy or our political systems work. Jo Bird uh, left the Labour Party. She has since stood on a Green Party platform in the world and got elected with a vast, overwhelming majority. She is a popular and effective councillor. Now, in terms of the accusations against her in anti-Semitism, I'm, I'm always careful not to rehash old Labour history because I think, you know, quite frankly, it's a bin fire that I just don't want to get involved with. And I, I'm proud of the Green Party uh, disciplinary process, which is entirely independent of the leadership. So I literally have nothing to do with that. And that's quite right. But I'm also confident that where someone has broken rules, then that does go through a disciplinary process. No one has ever been able to demonstrate any anti-Semitism around Joe Bird. The one thing that they're upset about is that she used the phrase due process, meaning Jewish rather than Jew. I'll remind your viewers of what you said at the very beginning of this. Joe Bird is Jewish. Do I think that's a great joke? No. Do I think it's an offensive joke? Absolutely not. And I think there has to just be a little bit of common sense here that if someone it, it, is it's, Jewish... It, it's like us as queer people, gay people, if we made a joke about like get a pun out of gay. Like, I mean, there's a long history of members of particular groups doing that, isn't it? Which you make jokes, which if was made by those who aren't a part of your group would be offensive, but it's different within. I mean, it's exactly that. And, and you know, I'd go one step further as well, because when I look at the attacks on me uh, and times I've been called an anti-Semite, people forgetting that literally I'm, I'm Jewish and I have that history as a Jewish deputy leader, that it's very often when we've just won a by-election or I've just been on BBC or Sky News talking about a wealth tax, you know, 1% tax on the wealthiest 1%, that, that's for starters, we'd need more than that. That'd raise about £75 billion, pounds. you know, a pretty non-contentious issue, I think, you know, something that the country desperately needs. And then you get Labour saying there's no money left, oh, but also we're not going to do a wealth tax. You know, that... that <laughs> And then just suddenly there'll suddenly be attacks on, on my personal character or on Jewish members within the party. And, you know, I think it's nakedly transparent. And the final thing I would say on this is anti-Semitism is real as transphobia and hom homophobia is. And it is on the rise both in the UK and around the world and needs to be taken with the utmost severity. And the weaponization of it or the false accusations of it for political gain is playing with fire. And as a Jewish person, I would plead with people not to do this. And this is exactly why I just said at the very beginning of this that the Labour councillor who was throwing accusations at me is Jewish themselves. So I'm not throwing out an accusation of anti-Semitism because these things are serious. Yeah. And it's just it's like it's been watered down and you can just shout it at any moment. When that happens, you miss the real anti-Semitism that goes on. You miss the real homophobia that goes on. And I know I'm not talking to someone who will be ignorant to what homophobia or hate looks like online and what it looks like in your DMs and just this constant barrage from the right that often happens whenever you tweet anything progressive. Uh, it happened just today. I tweeted about solidarity with refugees yesterday, sorry. And suddenly lots of people in the DM saying things like my surname doesn't sound very British and, and things like that. And these things are constant yeah. and they get missed if we get involved with silly, ridiculous claims. And so I just think there really needs to be a line drawn under this. The Labour Party need to get its own uh, house in order. I think Don Butler has recently been very clear about problems in her party. Now, I'm not trying to bandwagon that. Don Butler is old enough and more than capable of, enough to hold that to herself and, and solidarity there. And I'm not using it to attack the Labour Party because I'm sure there will be instances where there are problems in the Green Party too, but ultimately we all need to take responsibility for that and stop playing silly games online because it has serious consequences. Just just a couple of things finally, because I know you're very busy and you've got meetings to go to, but um, the climate emergency, I really do think after the extreme weather events this summer, I think it's just so much more real in people's heads than it's been ever, actually. But do you think the problem is people, partly because of the right and others muddying the water, still see action to deal with it as sacrifices, making their living standards worse and all the rest of it. And what is the kind of response to that? Yeah, so it's a huge problem. And I think it comes right back to that intersectionality, that idea that everything connects. I think we haven't communicated well enough yet, and I take responsibility for this too, 
communicating how the poorest and most vulnerable people are facing the worst impacts of the climate crisis. So when you take ULEZ, for instance, I voted for ULEZ, I've supported Sadiq Khan on ULEZ. When Keir Starmer and the Labour Party were not supporting Sadiq Khan on ULEZ, uh, the Green Party were very vocal that we did support Sadiq Khan on ULEZ. You know, when someone gets something right, you support them and you back them up on it. Um, air pollution in London there is a very direct correlation between the areas with the most toxic uh, air pollution and those areas with black and brown communities and or working class communities. That link is very clear. Also, the poorest people in London do not drive cars. And yes, we need to invest in public transport because ultimately if driving a private car is cheaper than getting on a bus or a tube, that is an unsustainable situation. Now, all of those things are complex in themselves and, and need to be kind of looked at in policy detail, which we do, but the headline is this that to tackle the climate crisis, we need to make sure we're protecting the poorest people and making sure we're transferring people with uh, with their design and their co-creation into greener jobs, into better paid jobs, into unionised jobs. And I think there's a huge opportunity there that is missing from Labour and certainly the Tories' manifestos and ideas. And I think we need to sell that more. Just another example, flooding, you know, homes are at risk of flooding. If you uh, are rich enough, you can build flood defences. You will be insulated possibly from floods. If you rent, your landlord might not listen to you. You're also less likely to be insured. And so your property is more likely to be destroyed. And of course, if you're homeless, this problem is even more exacerbated. So in every way, the climate crisis, particularly the worst impacts of it, will face the poorest, the worst. So I think it's about people recognizing, one, we've got to protect those people. Um, we've got to not do things to them in a kind of top-down way, but also we've got to engage at a grassroots level so people feel like they're co-designing what their communities looks like in response to the climate crisis. But second, we've also exactly, it was framed in your question, got to get people to stop looking at sacrifice and start looking at gain. And I think there's a sense in this country amongst most people, whoever you are, that the country just isn't quite working. I say whoever you are, if you're super rich, it's totally working for you and it's working in the way it's designed to. But for the vast majority of the country, it feels like things are broken. It feels like our communities aren't as together as maybe they once were. It feels like there's this kind of real shift in society where we are being divided and there is a toxic rhetoric, particularly around climate conversations. And I think we've got to start combating that with hope and vision. And naturally, I would say that partly happens by electing Greens, but I also think it happens outside the political system too. It happens with community groups coming together and saying we're not going to stand for this anymore and lobbying politicians to, to get things better. I think the Green Party is in that perfect sweet spot again where we are taking politics seriously and we're serious about Westminster but also we have that grassroots background where we're constantly embedded in that kind of more community campaigning and I think when those two things come together there's nothing more powerful and I think we're seeing that in America with amazing people like AOC and Cory Bush and I think we need more of that politics going on in the UK. Just very lastly, because I know you need to go, Caroline Hutchins on Patreon asks, as someone who feels the Green Party most lines my views, I find it hard to justify voting Green in a seat that is deemed only winnable by Tories or Green. I feel I have to vote Lib Dem to try and keep the Tories out until we get PR. What's your view on tactical voting and how many seats the Green Party are going to get after the election? This is coming from someone who would love more Green MPs. Um, so I think the first thing is if you live in Bristol Central uh, or you live in Brighton, which are two of the main places where we're looking to, to have our two Green MPs as well as other places too, but particularly mention Bristol City, uh, Bristol Central and Brighton. Uh, Tories cannot win there. They are so far behind that actually there's no even need for conversations about tactical voting. And I'd also say this to you. Um, if you were going to vote Labour anyway and you choose to vote Green, the worst case scenario, the very worst case scenario is you get the Labour MP you would have voted anyway. The best case scenario is you get Carla Denyer MP, Sean Berry MP, two amazing politicians who are so right and so correct on so many issues and will hold Keir Starmer uh, to account every single day and will pack an incredible incredible punch. I don't really like violent metaphors, but I couldn't find anything else other than punch. If you, live other, other, if you live other places that aren't those places, every vote that you're voting for, essentially, if you vote enough, if enough people vote green, then we will get green MPs. And that also makes the case for proportional representation, because we've seen times in this country where over a million people have voted green, yet we've got one MP. And then you get, you know, uh, 50,000 people, I think, and you get a Tory MP for every 50,000 people. I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's massively disproportionate. So by voting Green, you are sending a very clear signal to the Conservatives, but probably more importantly to the Labour Party at this point, to say that you are not happy with the direction that Keir Starmer is going. You don't want him to U-turn on refugees. You want him to stand with striking workers. You want to make the point that there's no environmental justice without social, racial and economic justice too. And every Green vote is making that case. 
Great stuff, Zach. Thank you. We, I think in a short space of time, covered a whole lot of ground. Um, brilliant stuff. Do follow Zach Polanski on social media. I'm sure many of you will do so after listening to that. Very eloquent and thorough interview. Um, so Can I just like, say a big okay. thank you to you two, Owen? Sorry to interrupt you, but everything you're doing on trans rights in particular, I think the media are completely absent on it. And the fact that you have platformed trans voices uh, deserves commendation at every moment. Sorry to interrupt. Well, no, no, that's very sweet. It's, uh, it should be the kind of least kind of bare minimum particularly uh, any queer person with a platform should be doing at the moment. I mean, what's happening to our trans siblings is brutal. And I'm so glad we have politicians like you uh, who are also doing everything you can to stand in solidarity with them during a, a brutal and escalating general anti-LGBTQ backlash. So uh, thank you right back at you. There we go. Mutual thanks. Uh, press like and subscribe. And thank you so much to you, Zach.